Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to begin our review over basically all of AP US Gov this week. So we'll go day by day and look at each unit. This first unit is the foundational stuff. All of our, you know, basic, basic foundational understandings of government and where the ideas for American government came from. So I've got here some big general ideas as far as kind of what we based government on at the very beginning. We were emerging out of this tyrannical relationship with an oppressive government. And so ideas emerged that we wanted to hold on to no matter what. So the first of this is limited government. The idea with all of these is that we hold on to the power uh, that we give to governments. We are the ones that deliver this power to our government. And so inherently, the more power we give away, the less power we have. And so with limited government, we want to limit the amount of power that we give. And so we want government to be as small, as unobtrusive, un, you know, as little intrusion as possible within our lives. The foundation of that is natural rights, that we inherently have the rights of life, liberty, happiness, property. And that comes from God. That comes from a greater being. It does not come from our government. Therefore, we give that power to the government. That idea is seen with popular sovereignty, that we hold the power. Um, we are the ones that truly give government its power. Popular sovereignty is power of the people, basically. This all comes to a head with the social contract where, you know, in order to best protect ourselves, in order to have our best shot at forming community that can be long lasting and safe, we need to enter into some form of government or relationship with one another. We give the power that's given to us by God to the government in exchange for protection. We give away some of our liberty, some of our freedoms in exchange for security. And then this last idea of republicanism is not the Republican Party that we associate with, you know, in modern times, it is a republic that we choose people to do the work for us. We elect people to carry out policy decisions. That is a republic. So we live in a, you know, democratic republic. We elect the people to do the work for us. All of these ideas are seen in the Declaration of independence and the constitution really from the very beginning we see a ton of this in the declaration of independence popular sovereignty is the idea that you know it is the consent of the governed that gives government its power you know jefferson wrote of certain unalienable rights life liberty happiness that is the idea of natural rights and even, you know, talking about the extent of the social contract, saying it is an inherent right that we can overthrow government. Republicanism really shows up in the Constitution, and I will talk entirely about the Constitution in a second. First, uh, we will look at the three ideas of democracy. We see each of these play out within our own government, participatory, pluralist, and elitist. And it essentially moves from most democratic to least democratic. Participatory is broad participation with as many people as possible. It is the caucus where, you know, conversation happens that helps to choose the people. It is, you know, your local elections where you can, you know, choose your city officials by tens or maybe hundreds of votes. Um, 
that is the broadest form of democracy. With pluralist, the idea is that if we are to form groups of like-minded people, we have our best chance at eventually leading to compromise. So groups will always be vying for power. And as they vie for power, they will eventually compromise with one another. We it, it wouldn't lead to tyranny. It's more that, you know, you have to keep the other groups in mind. Otherwise, you might get ousted. So what we look at today is the idea of political parties uh, or interest groups. These are both examples of pluralist democracy. This is both argued for and argued against in foundational documents. So in Federalist 10, the idea of a pluralist democracy is argued against. The idea of factions, you know, could arise that would splinter democracy, would lead to, you know, eventual tyranny uh, and a lack of compromise. Whereas in Brutus 1, uh, you know, a popular, small, decentralized government is argued for. With smaller groups, you have a greater chance at having your opinion heard, and, you know, it would eventually lead to more compromise. And then finally, we have the elitist democracy. It is virtually the opposite of this participatory democracy, you know, Essentially, government should be entrusted to a few trustworthy, you know, educated, powerful people. Um, and so this is, as we'll see with the Constitution, what happens with our electoral college. We do not choose the president. It is a small group of electors that will eventually choose it. So before we get to the Constitution, we'll look at the difference between Federalists and anti-federalists. Federalists are for a stronger central government. Anti-federalists are for more state sovereignty. They basically do this for different reasons. The federalists, again, that main argument happens in Fed 10, saying, look, if you have a pure democracy, the majority will always tyrannize the minority. If you have a republic, it can better deal with the natural divisions that people have. You know, if you keep this strong central government and limit the impact of factions, we have a greater chance at long success. Whereas the anti-federalists, you know, basically are saying, hey, we just came from a tyrannical government. If you give us this tyrannical government again, I'm sure it'll just lead to revolution in a few years. They really push for state sovereignty, limited federal government, a lot of local policy, and very notably the Bill of Rights, ensuring the individual rights and liberties of people. And so, again, they mostly come up in Brutus One, making a smaller, more democratic government can avoid tyranny. So I would highly recommend going back, looking at Fed 10, looking at Brutus 1 to get a better idea of those two groups. So before we get to the Constitution, we look at the Articles of Confederation, our first real attempt um, at a Constitution. As we know, it does some things OK, but it does other things very poorly. Um, they, the federal government has no power to tax. They have no power to, you know, demand funds from different states. States really wouldn't give that many funds. Um, and while they had the power to raise armies, they couldn't really organize it or pay them that well. And so we see Shays Rebellion, where the government is unable to deal with an uprising. Um, and so the clear failures of this, you know, Constitution essentially make Hamilton say at the Constitutional Convention, 
we don't need to revise the Articles of Confederation. We need to totally overturn it um, and try something new. So we need in this convention a brand new constitution and we need to come up with a lot of compromises because as of right now, this thing is not going to work. OK, so that's one of the key ideas with this constitution is that it is full of compromises. We have the great compromise. We have large states and we have small states. The large states say that, you know, power in the government should be determined by population. Small states say that it should be equal representation among the states, leading us to a bicameral legislature, a House and a Senate. House determined by population, Senate determined equally with equal representation, basically. So we have a bicameral legislature. Uh, we have the compromise on the election of the president. You know, we move from thinking about a popular vote. Uh, you know, Hamilton is pretty much arguing for that elite democracy, and he really pushes for the electoral college, which is the modern system that we have. And then we have, you know, moving from compromises between big and small states, we now have compromises essentially between North and South states. The North wants to abolish slavery. The South wants to keep slavery going. And so when determining, you know, which states will have the most power, population is a huge part of that. Now, for years leading to the Constitutional Convention, the South did not count slaves as part of their population. But now with the emergence of the House as a, you know, potential, you know, form of legislature, they want to make their population seem as high as possible. So they say, well, no, no, no. Now, you know, all of our enslaved people fully count as citizens of the state. They just don't have any rights. The North rightfully calls that out as BS. Um, and this messed up agreement happens where for every five enslaved people, it counts as three towards that state's population. This is pretty significant. Um, we see, you know, both with agriculture and with population, the South has a larger amount of power than I think the North expected. And so with that influence, the South has a large number of the presidents starting off uh, at the country's founding. The final compromise is the compromise on the importation of slaves. Like I said, North wants to totally abolish slavery. Uh, the South, you know, doesn't. And so they're nearing the end of conversation and they're just saying, OK, we're just going to push it. We'll talk about it in 20 years. And that's literally the compromise is we are not going to discuss the slave trade for 20 years, um, you know, and it, yeah, it's a band aid on a much larger issue that we still see today. Moving into the nitty gritty of it, um, we also have basically our functions of government. So we have an amendment process. They knew that the Constitution would need to be changed. They expected that the Constitution would be totally revised every 50 years or so. And what we eventually see is that there's 27 significant changes to the Constitution, including 10 coming from the Bill of Rights. So our amendment process, if an amendment is to be passed, it needs to get through two thirds of both houses of Congress. So, you know, at least two thirds of people need to vote for it. And then it goes down to the state legislatures where three quarters of the state legislatures have to agree um, on the amendment. There's another form where, you know, it starts in the state legislature, but that's never happened. Every amendment so far has gone from, you know, the federal government to the state governments. With the Constitution, uh, a huge theme is the 
division of power, checks and balances. Again, they're trying to fight against that tyrannical rule. They want to make sure that no one branch has a significant amount of power. So what we see is power separated among three different branches, all having checks and balances against each other. Federalist 51 does a very good job explaining this. What we see are things like exclusive powers where the branch, you know, is the only branch that can do something. We also see concurrent powers where, you know, some branches can do similar things. This happens at the federal and state level as well. There's, you know, concurrent powers that both the federal government and state government can do. Uh, and then there's reserve powers that are just limited to the states. So Congress is able to tax, they're able to declare war, they're able to regulate interstate commerce. We will talk about that in a second. And they are the ones that are able to make laws. The executive executes those laws. They are the commander in chief. Um, they have veto power and they are also able to negotiate tra uh, treaties uh, among international groups. The judicial branch is not given a lot of power in the Constitution, and it doesn't happen until Marbury v. Madison that really the power of the judicial branch is established. Uh, that is what we call judicial review, where essentially the Supreme Court was able to rule uh, a federal law unconstitutional. And that did a lot to kind of hone in on the power of this, you know, weak, misunderstood branch. Like I briefly got into, we have a federal, um, you know, form of government. It does not specifically relate to the federal branch. Federalism is the relationship between state and federal governments. And this is laid out in the 10th Amendment where it says that states have reserved powers that they hold on to. Like I said, some are exclusionary, some um, are exclusive, some are concurrent. You know, you get your driver's license from the state of Georgia, uh, you get your license plate, whatever. That is a Georgia thing. You, you know, receive tax from local, state, and federal governments, those are concurrent powers. What we eventually saw is a move from layer cake federalism towards marble cake federalism. The responsibilities in layer cake are very divided. They never overstepped one another. The federal government did this, the state government did this, the local government did this. And what we've eventually moved towards is marble cake federalism, which has started to blend these things together, um, essentially intertwining all of the responsibilities. We see it a lot with education nowadays, how there are federal, state, and local mandates for education that are all kind of interconnected. Um, briefly attached to federalism is the idea of money, basically, that you know, the federal government has a significantly larger budget than the state government, and sometimes they have to divvy out money among the states. This is called fiscal federalism, basically the federalism of money. So sometimes you have things like block grants that is, you know, just federal government giving the state government money with really no strings attached at all. Um, Sometimes there are categorical grants where it's money, um, but there are certain things you have to do. And then you have funded and unfunded mandates where there are specific things the federal government is demanding that states do. And, you know, they essentially have to follow along with that. So let's think about an example uh, of all four. OK, the you know, federal government wants to give the state government uh, money to work on transportation. OK, if it was a block grant, um, you know, the federal government would give the state government money 
and say, here you go, do with it what you will. Sometimes it'll be spent on transportation, sometimes it won't. If they do a categorical grant, they say, okay, here's $100 million for transportation. Spend this on transportation. A funded mandate is, okay, here's $100 million for transportation. Make sure that the speed limit is never above 60 miles per hour wherever you go. You need this many lanes, all of that stuff. The unfunded mandate is no money for transportation all speed limits are now 60 miles per hour. So those are brief examples. Over time, we've seen uh, essentially the legislature, you know, change between the federal and state governments. We talked about the 10th Amendment, how some powers are reserved for the states. The 14th Amendment is, you know, the Bill of Rights used to just apply federally and now there are mandates to make it apply at the state level. This is, you know, one of those reconstruction amendments establishing that, you know, enslaved people are citizens of the states and therefore the rights federally applied now apply to each of those states. We then see the necessary and proper clause and commerce clause, both giving a lot of power to the federal branch Congress can make any law they choose that, you know, essentially allows them to execute their responsibilities. The Commerce Clause is the right of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. What we see happen is essentially two court cases that kind of explore the depth uh, and scope of these two clauses. So we remember in McCulloch v. Maryland, Maryland doesn't want a federal bank. The Supreme Court says you have to have a federal bank. Um, the ruling of the federal government overrules the state government. And so this is an example of the, you know, supremacy idea that federal decisions outweigh state decisions. With US v. Lopez, we see movement away from that idea. So, you know, there's a federal law. It is the Gun Violence Act in schools. Um, and basically, Congress said, well, you know, this is related to interstate commerce tangentially. It's not super connected, but it's kind of a loose connection. What eventually happens is that the Supreme Court will rule in favor of states saying this is not super related to that commerce clause. This is just something that you're trying to loosely connect. So I highly recommend going back. Um, I think you should have a good idea of the terms, but look at those required foundational documents, Fed 10, Brutus 1, uh, as well as the Articles of Confederation, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and then look at those two court cases, McCulloch v. Maryland, U.S. v. Lopez, I think you will be in a good position.